So Michael Moore's latest documentary, Planet of the Humans, was a scathing attack on renewable energy, labeling it as no better than coal and saying the only real way to have a sustainable future is to massively change the way we consume power, probably starting with a massive decrease in the population, lest we face extinction. Now, I watched this documentary pretty much the day it came out, and all I knew about it going in was Michael's previous works, you know, Bowling for Columbine and Fahrenheit 911. So I thought this would be a pretty fair, if slightly left leaning, documentary. Boy, was I wrong. Now, this documentary doesn't feature Michael Moore at all, but is narrated and directed by his longtime producer, Jeff Gibbs, whose voice sounds about as dry as burnt toast. It started with him talking about how ever since he was a kid, he was always been a greenie on the forefront of the green movement, solar panels, covering it, reporting it. And based off his you know, previous work with Michael Moore, I had no reason to doubt him, which just basically further legitimized him in my eyes, something I'm sure he was keenly aware of. And while this documentary does contain some good points, it is a dumpster fire of lies and misinformation. So I won't be biased, I'll actually cover what he got right in this documentary, but if you want to jump straight to the criticism, uh, go to this point in the video. The first good point he makes is just because it's green doesn't automatically make it good. For instance, they go to a site in Lowell Mountain in Vermont where they're cutting down a large forest to put up 21 wind generators. And one of the downsides of wind and solar is they do take up a relatively large amount of space compared to say a coal plant. Although this can be mitigated by you know, putting solar on roofs. Uh, also, if you live near a desert, which is otherwise unusable, that is a prime candidate for solar. A, you can't use the space, and B, it gets plenty of sun. Wind turbines are very commonly placed in farms through Europe and Australia, which is great because instead of having to cut down a forest to erect a wind farm, all you're doing is putting a tower sort of this big in a field, which is otherwise just can still be used for cattle grazing or whatever it was previously used for. It's taken up almost no space. All right, wind farms are great. They're one of the best in terms of uh, buyback, but cutting down a large part of forest just to put up a few windmills, I think we can do a bit better than that. Now, that was his only legitimate point about wind or solar. The rest of it is just complete rubbish, and I'll get to that in a minute. But the second half of the documentary was not too bad where it talked about biofuels. Now, biofuels is when you burn things that aren't coal or natural gas. For instance, I'm sure everyone's heard about Denmark burning so much rubbish that they've had to import rubbish from other countries to burn. But the main thing they burn as biofuels is trees. And these massive logging companies have disguised themselves as green energy to cut down trees for fuel. The only problem with this is if the trees are burnt while they're still too green or they're wet, they don't burn hot enough. So what's the solution to this problem? Adding in tires like this biofuel plant that leaves a lovely black tar residue all over the neighbouring kindergarten. And as far as burning trash, I'm sure the Nordic companies have state-of-the-art filters which can catch everything except herpes. But not every plant is that advanced, like this one in Michigan which is near this sassy black woman and her neighbours who complain about the smell. And one of the reasons biofuel is increasing in popularity is that it's meant to be green, which means it's eligible for government rebates which means that this biofuel plant, which burns car tires next to a preschool, has received $11.5 million in government incentives. And biofuel plants are even more common in Europe. In fact, over 60% of Europe's green energy comes from biofuel. And most of the wood they burn comes from America. This Business Insider article says that 98% of American deforestation is sent to Europe. And that number is surely vastly inflated. But I can still believe that it is a majority of trees. Trees are cut down in America, loaded into ships, then sent to Europe. And then burnt, releasing all that carbon into the atmosphere. And that is called carbon neutral clean energy. The reason why they call it carbon neutral is because even though when you burn trees, you're releasing massive amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, they say that you can plant more trees, which will then suck that carbon back into the ground as the tree grows. Only problem with that is it takes about a month to burn through a forest because trees aren't that energy dense compared to coal or natural gas. And it's going to take 50 years for that forest to regrow. So making the argument it'll grow back eventually didn't work when I cut my sister's hair off 
and it doesn't work now. But biofuel plants aren't all bad across the globe. For instance, if you tear down a house which has a lot of old wood you can't use or, or extra wood from a sawmill or waste that can be burnt to make energy, you're better off burning it rather than just putting it in landfill as long as you have a biofuel plant with the proper filters to catch you know, as much carbon as you can or all the sulfur or any of the harmful toxic particulates. But as a main source of fuel, just deforesting plants just for biofuel sounds like a terrible idea. However, even though it doesn't make any logical sense to cut down trees to burn, it does make financial sense thanks to, as I previously mentioned, the government rebates, which is why when Al Gore convinced Richard Branson to donate $3 billion towards green energy, Richard Branson said this. Branson is pledging future profits from his airline to the tune of perhaps $3 billion. $3 billion, that's the B, to fight global warming. Is Al Gore a prophet? <laughs> um, uh, I just spelled profit. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> Fuck poor people. The worst part is, this could have been a convincing documentary about biofuels and how this industry has been propagated by government-backed green incentives. And the fact that biofuels are even considered green, carbon, neutral fuel sources at all. They are not. And this documentary had the platform to expose that to the world. And it kind of did that. But it has been such overshadowed by all the lies and misinformation. The whole section about biofuels, I haven't seen that discussed at all in any criticisms I've read of the documentary. So, speaking of criticisms, let's get onto them. And the way I'm going to do this is I'll just play the deceitful lies from the documentaries and then just rip the absolute shit out of them. What's charging the, the batteries right now? What, where, where, what's the source of a... Well, like here. It's, it's coming from the building. I mean, are, is it... Um, what's our mix of power? Oh, actually, Lansing feeds the building. What's that? Lansing feeds power to the building. So I don't, I don't know... They're... Uh... I bet they're a bit of coal. Well, they're heavy on natural gas, aren't they? Yeah, right now, the car is charging off of your grid. Right. Well, it would be charging off... Uh... Our grid, which is nine, about 95% coal. So what he's trying to say here is that it's an electric car, but it's being powered by coal, so it's no better than if you just ran a car on fuel. The thing is, though, it's still better. See, an electric car is about 80% efficient, right? They're incredibly efficient motors. They don't give off a lot of heat. But as he pointed out, they get their power from coal. Now, a coal power plant is around 40% efficient. If it's a natural gas power plant, it could be around 55% efficient. So what you end up with is if you charge an electric car based off coal or natural gas, you end up using 36% to around 45% of the total energy usage. Now, that's not that great. That's less than half. Petrol cars, however, a high efficient petrol car is still around 17% efficient. So even if you power an electric car off of coal from the mains, that's still far better than a petrol car. What outfit are you with? New World Media, we're doing a segment on the renewable energy. Oh, excuse me, I gotta go okay, for a second, sorry. but thanks. Now this was how they presented it. And what they did here was they tried to make New World Media look all scary. But you see he has changed location between the two shots. So clearly there's been a large amount of time between those two shots. He didn't instantly get scared at the sound of New World Media. It's just propaganda. How many homes would this array provide electricity? Well, the standard answer that we tell everybody is we're providing enough to meet the peak requirements of 50 homes. Okay. However... For most of the people that look at it a little bit closer, we generate about 63, 64,000 kilowatt hours a year. Our average customer uses about 6,000 kilowatt hours a year. 6,000 into 64 is just a little over 10. We can meet the energy requirements for 10 homes over a year. So 63,000 kilowatts, <clears throat> that's not a lot for a football size array, especially when we built 
a football size array in Australia just a couple of years ago, which provides 1,500 megawatt hours. Now this is Michigan, I'm in Australia, we get a lot more sun. So, you know, and maybe our football fields are bigger. I think they are bigger. So let's say if we were to scale for the amount of sun and let's say our football sizes are twice the size, this should still be getting around 426 megawatt hours. And the reason why I say that number so specifically is because they recently built a new solar field in Michigan, which was also the same size as a football field, which is now producing 436 megawatt hours. Right, That's not a fault of solar. That's the fault of either old technology, because this was built like 13 years ago, or just very terrible panels. Don't blame solar for your problems. How long are these uh, towers supposed to last? 20, 20 something years. 20 I know. It's just, you, oh, it's, wait a minute. You're it's kidding me. It's a nanosecond. Me. 20 years. Oh, it's a nanosecond in the time of energy. Now, here's the thing. Wind currently lasts about 20 years as the, te as the technology progresses. You know, they'll last longer and longer. But even still, because so much of wind can be recycled, the estimate CO2 payback time is six months. So if the CO2 pays itself back in six months, the next 19 and a half years, you're getting free clean energy. That's brilliant. That's like... 95, 94% of its life is clean energy. It's paying itself back 40 times over. Nature, in which he posed the question, do non-fossil energy sources actually replace fossil fuels? Well, we implicitly assume often the substitute pushes out the, the thing you want it to substitute for. What you find is nations that add non-fossil energy sources do not seem to see a particular suppression of fossil fuel use. That's pretty mind-blowing. We've got billions of dollars being spent, and green energy is not even replacing fossil fuels. They don't even know that that's a question. Yes. So first of all, you can't pump more energy into the grid than is being used. Otherwise, it overloads or something. So if you are making a lot of energy from wind or solar, obviously you need to be burning less coal. Now, in terms of coal power plants, that is probably a 20, 30, 40 year delay in terms of you know, new power plants being built because they're not just gonna start shutting down coal power plants left and right when they turn on a couple of panels. It's gonna be a long process. And solar panels have really only been good, well, they've actually, solar panels have actually only really gotten good in the last five years, right? Before that, they were kind of shit. Technology has massively improved. So there's that. And also, as I was editing this, I saw this story about how the Australian energy grid, which was historically coal, is asking for an authoritarian level of control over personal home solar energy because they're putting too much power into the grid. So I think that answers the question, is solar displacing coal? Ozzy Zenner, a visiting scholar at UC Berkeley and Northwestern University, was asking some of the same questions. I mean, I thought that solar and wind were probably very good solutions. I mean, it wasn't really even that long ago. One of the most dangerous things right now is the illusion that alternative technologies like wind and solar are somehow different from fossil fuels. Now, around 24 minutes into the documentary, they introduce Ozzy Zenner, who is a visiting scholar. And, you know, he was first really pro-green energy and now he's gone to anti-green energy and we'll hear from him more later. Problem with this is, if we go to the Wikipedia page of this documentary, look who we have here. Ozzy Zena is actually a producer of this documentary. They introduce him here as a independent professional on green energy. He's the one fucking pushing this message with the other guy. When we add solar cells or wind turbines to a grid, do we get to shut off a coal plant? Uh, that's certainly the goal. The problem is, or the difference is that renewables are intermittent. All of a sudden, a cloud cover could come over and, all, and your solar generation could drastically decrease. And if you don't have something else there to meet whatever the load is at that moment, uh, then you're going to have power outages. So we don't get to turn a fossil fuel power plant off when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing? Well, it's not that easy. We need to be able to back up that power to keep the system steady all the time so it doesn't collapse. 
most likely that's through fast acting gas plants, but also the what we call the baseload plants, either nuclear or coal that are on all the time, but that maybe can be dialed down during the day and dialed up when demand starts rising. So what they're trying to say here is there's no point in using wind or solar because you still need coal anyway, or coal or natural gas anyway. And again, that's completely wrong because yeah, we can't overnight click our fingers and go to complete solar, but we can head in that right direction and start relying more and more on solar and less and less on coal. Start slowly reducing the amount of coal we're burning and invest in solar. Right? No one's saying this is going to be an overnight thing. Does it affect the efficiency to turn fossil fuel power plants on and off? Oh yeah, they don't like to be dialed up and down. Uh, it does make, it, that's wear and tear for them. So now he's saying that if we use wind and solar, we have to crank the fossil fuel plants up and down all the time, which will cause more wear and tear. We have to do that anyway, because like most people use power during the day and then at nighttime, there's a massive drop in power. So they have to already turn the power plants up during the day and turn them down at night. If anything, solar and wind primarily work best during the day because it's more windy during the day and obviously there's sunlight during the day. So if anything, when solar and wind are kicking during the day, that'll mean we won't have to crank coal power plants up as high and then turn them right down at night. We'll be able to keep coal power plants on a baseload level and that peak of power uses during the day will be picked up from wind and solar. So if anything, this is an argument for wind and solar, not against. What's the solution then? You need energy storage. Without storage, you can't count on it. If you can store the energy that's created off of things that are intermittent, like solar and wind, you can store that, then you're now you're reducing your need for a base load. But would adding storage like batteries increase the carbon footprint? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it, in a big way, actually. And as more energy storage gets on the grid, um, it, it has a mass scale implication. When I looked up how much battery storage there is, it was less than one-tenth of one percent of what's needed. In a couple of years, they begin to degrade and need to be replaced a few years later. Now, this is such a disingenuous graph, I can't even begin to explain. Oh, I can actually. So this is global energy usage versus current global battery capacity. One, we don't need to store an entire year's worth of energy, okay? We need to store about two hours worth of energy. If let's say clouds come through and solar panels die off, you know, and we want to just tap into some of that and it battery reserve, all we need to do is tap into it for a couple of hours until, you know, the sun comes out again, or they can predict with weather charts, they know how long the cloud's going to last so they can gradually turn the power plant up or down to compensate using that battery as a, a buffer so they don't have to crank the power right up or right down. And quite frankly, we could use batteries now anyway. I'm sure there's a surge in power, you know, when people get home at five o'clock. So we could use that battery capacity now to, you know, take up some slack in that, in that surge so we don't have to go cranking power stations. Again, so they've shown global annual energy usage when really we just need to store it for maybe two hours or so. And global battery capacity, current battery capacity. Again, this is just as a ridiculous figure because no one's really trying to store electricity at the moment, especially not globally. Like you're talking about developing nations and all that shit. No one's really trying to store it. And, you know, the technology isn't quite there yet. Samsung is working on, they've just announced a patent for a very exciting solid state lithium ion battery. Also the inventor of the lithium ion battery, the first one, him and his team have also issued or applied for a patent for a new type of solid state lithium ion battery. Essentially what that means is you're gonna get triple the capacity from the same amount of lithium and they're gonna be safer and better. It's gonna be incredible when they figure that out, but that exceeds the scope of this video. 
I learned that the solar panels don't last forever either. Some solar panels are built for to last only 10 years, so that it's not it's not as if you get this like you know just magic free energy, right? I don't know that it's you know the solution, and here I am self, you know helping to sell. Now, one of the criticisms I did read about this documentary is that it appears that some of their footage is very very old, right? Solar panels lasting 10 years? No, not anymore. Maybe in early 2000s, you know, 2007, but now pretty much they're guaranteed to work for 25 years. Most currently reading was that, you know, they degraded about 0.5% per year. So after 25 years, they're still at 88.5% of their maximum efficiency. And you can build in redundancies. So when you have a plant, say you want 100 panels, you do the pre-wiring for 120. Then in 10 years time, it's dropped down 5%, slap another five panels in, 10 years time, it's dropped another 5%, slap another five panels in and then after 25 years all your main panels are at 85 percent efficiency but you can put in an extra 20 panels boosting it by 20 percent and then all of a sudden your farm lasts 50 years before they have to be replaced so you know there's things like that you can do which double the lifespan of the solar arrays with only 20 percent extra panels materials is that it takes an incredible amount of energy to mine and process all of the materials that go into building something like this. You use more fossil fuels to do this than you're getting benefit from it. You would have been better off just yeah. burning the fossil fuels in the first place instead of playing pretend. So that's just simply not true. As I said before, with wind farms, they have a CO2 payback of around six months. Uh, solar panels these days they have a CO2 payback period of around one year, one to two years. So that's, it's just a lie. But Germany is still Europe's largest consumer of coal. So before that was shown a montage of all these people saying Germany is really pushing for renewable energy, but they're pointing out Germany still uses the most coal out of any European countries. And yeah, because one, all European countries are pushing for renewables at around the same rate, but also Germany has by far the biggest population, which means they're going to need the most amount of energy. And they do the most manufacturing of all the European countries. And manufacturing also requires a lot of energy. They make double the cars of the next European country. And cars use a lot of energy to manufacture and recycle because all the German cars are recycled and turned into new cars. So that is an energy intense process, which is why, along with their biggest population, they use the most CO2. Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla, when he announced his Gigafactory battery plant, he said it would power itself with wind and solar energy. Through a combination of geothermal, wind and solar, it will produce all the energy that it needs. But in fact, it has lines connecting it to the same electrical grid that we're all connected to. Of course, they need to be connected to the grid to build the place in the first place. They can't just, you know, make shit happen out of thin air. And then they're not going to go ahead and just cut it all down. Because what would be the point of that? Tesla's electric cars are built with aluminum, which uses eight times more energy to manufacture than steel. This statement would be correct if he had said... Aluminium takes eight times more electrical energy to produce than steel. See, aluminium is separated from the bauxite ore through a process of electrolysis, which uses a lot of electrical energy, whereas steel or iron is separated from the iron ore through a furnace, which uses coal or chemical energy. So because they use different energy sources, you know, one uses electrical, one uses chemical energy, obviously the aluminium uses more electrical energy, a lot more electrical energy than iron, which doesn't really use any electrical energy. However, if you actually compare the two energy sources, that gap narrows a lot. And aluminium, raw aluminium, still takes about twice the amount of energy to be manufactured than steel. But because aluminium has a much lower melting point and you can recycle steel and aluminium like like an infinite number of times without them losing quality, aluminium uses much less energy, half the amount of energy, in fact, to be recycled. So if you look at the lifetime of a metal, which can technically be used an infinite number of times, 
aluminium uses far less energy over its life over a period of 200 years than steel would just because it's so much easier to recycle. So recycle your aluminium cans. Apple claims to be 100% renewable. We never stop thinking about what's best for the planet. We now run Apple on 100% renewable energy. All of our facilities worldwide. And they did chop down a forest to put up solar panels near their North Carolina plant. But they didn't disconnect from the grid, and they can't. Duke says energy-hungry companies like Apple can never go entirely off the grid. They're still hooked up to our grid. Despite all of the claims, I haven't found a single entity anywhere in the world that's running on 100% solar and wind alone. Again, this is another completely massive deception. What he's trying to conflate is people running 100% off renewable energy and being disconnected from the grid. Now, just because you can run 100% off wind or solar and still be connected to the grid, in fact, unless you go investing heavily in batteries, which we've already established their technology isn't quite there yet, you have to be connected to the grid because let's say you're Tesla and you're run entirely off solar. During the day, you know, the solar panels are making 120% of your energy needs. Most of that you're using immediately. And the other 20% is going out onto the grid because they're still connected to the grid. Then at nighttime, when the sun dies off, they take back that 20% of energy they put in there during the day and, you know, to run lights or whatever at nighttime. So that's why they're all still connected to the grid because the grid, they essentially use a grid as a battery to store some of their electricity. They pump it out during the day and then draw it back at night. So they can still be 100% renewable and be connected to the grid. In fact, they need the grid as a battery. Not far from Ivanpah Solar, Daggett, California was home to several generations of solar arrays, including some of the first on the planet. Ozzy and I thought we would take a trip to see where it all began. one of the sunniest places in the planet, really. The, the center of the solar industry. And they've been building and dismantling and building arrays here for about uh, 40 years. So they show all this footage of this old rundown town and they call it the center of the solar industry. The center of the solar industry. No, it's not. It's the first test site in 1980. It's not the center of the solar industry. They're making it look like, oh, there's big fancy buildings and whatnot. No, it was like, oh, okay, we're in California. Oh, this place is close by. It's sunny. Let's, let's put it there. They have the room. That's like saying the center for space technology is the moon. Then we happen to run into the mayor of Daggett. I know the solar plants out there, my husband back in... Um, I'd say 83, 84, they worked out there building that solar plant out there. Yeah, the SEGS. And um, all, everybody here worked. How is that held up? Is it uh, the jobs still here? No. Jobs went bye-bye. So what she's saying is when the solar people came to town, everyone got a job working at the solar plant. Then when the solar plant was finished, they all got fired, and so they're blaming the solar plant for not having jobs. But... They didn't have jobs before the solar plant got there. That's why they all worked at the solar plant. So how were you blaming the solar plant for not having jobs when you already didn't have jobs? And also, I don't mean to be mean to this lady, but it's not a good sign of a booming economy when your mayor doesn't have teeth. Do you see this? Then Ozzy and I discovered that the giant solar arrays had been raised to the ground. Oh my God. I mean, this was huge. It suddenly dawned on me what we were looking at. A solar dead zone. Look at the blowing sand. Yeah, there's sand everywhere. There's sand dunes forming around this area. Wow. So I'm sure they planned this trip around this event. And what this event is, was replacing the old solar panels with new ones. Like I said, they first 
put solar panels there in the 80s, way before we were really ready to go solar. And they've replaced them a couple of times since then because the old panels didn't last that long. Um, but you can look in Google Maps and boom, there are the solar panels. They're, they're back. They just went in that time just to get that shot to lie. So after all the mining, the fossil fuels, the toxins, the environmental destruction, here's what happens next. Only a few years after it was built, things at Ivanpah began to fall apart. Broken mirrors littered the desert. Yes, these giant solar and wind technology installations may last only a few decades. Then tear it down and start all over again. Now they close out the documentary with footage of the broken panels of the Daggett Solar Array. Now these aren't solar panels, these are mirrors which they then use to focus light into a central column which heated up water and spun a turbine. Instead of using fuel to heat the water, they use the sun. Now this was a failure, right? It didn't work out nearly as well as they'd hoped. Uh, the reason they built this, they started building in 2014 or maybe before. Again, and they built this because at the time, solar panels weren't that efficient and they also cost quite a bit. Since then, really in the last couple of years, like we've been making massive gains in solar panels. This solar array type setup is not that viable. You know, they tried it. It was an attempt. It didn't work nearly as well as they'd hoped, right? We got to try these things. How else are we going to know unless we actually build them? Because solar arrays aren't the best solution does not mean that solar panels are shit. They, they have nothing to do with each other, to be honest. And the photos they used of those wind farms, they are very popular photos amongst the climate denial community. They are of wind turbines in Hawaii, which were built in 1983. Okay, they're 37 year old wind turbines. And the thing with Hawaii is it's right on the ocean, which means you get a lot of salt water spray and salt metal don't work too great. The turbines did last 20 years, they're full contract, right? Six month payback scheme, so still good. But, you know, metal and salt are not friends. So that's why they look like that. Plus, they had been decommissioned you know, by five years by the time that photo was taken. Again, it's a very popular climate denial photo. And that concludes their coverage on solar and wind. It was a complete dumpster fire of lies. And if you watch the documentary, start from the 50-minute mark. That point onwards is not a bad documentary on the negative impacts of biofuel and the economic incentives set up by government grants. But the first half was complete trash. Michael Moore, I, you know, expected better. I think everyone did. Uh, what were you thinking?